Central banks around the world are trying to stimulate the global economy, make money easy to borrow, increase liquidity. It's all about liquidity. Without real demand and real expansion of business activity, the financial system will come to a halt. This is what we can see happening now. So central banks have given up on the lie that they would be able to grow naturally and have instead focused on desperation and injected liquidity from every angle. That's when you know they've admitted reality. You came here for the truth, so let me unveil that for you. Today I have a lot of information to cover. We are going to talk about the Federal Reserve. We're going to look at interest rates. We're going to look at the stock market. I wanted to get into what is happening in the real economy, looking at the numbers, looking at the data. Let's get into it right away. If the Fed cuts rates this week, it could widen a growing rift within the central bank. And you can see that there are opposing views within the central bank, something that I have talked about before, looking at what the Dallas Fed is saying, very different than what we are getting from these FOMC meetings and the voting members, looking like they want to go towards a rate cut this time around. That's probably going to be the case, at least that's what most people believe. Of course, they are meeting right now as a request this a two-day meeting to decide something that is probably already in stone but regardless we're looking at that information right now I will bring it to you of course after it happens Former Fed Chair Janet Yellen says she's in favor of an interest rate cut. That's right, Janet Yellen, the person who said if it were positive to take interest rates into the negative, I would vote for that. I've shown you the quote before, and of course we see this time and time again. This is coming from the same person who said that she would not see another crisis in our lifetime. Are we talking about your lifetime or my lifetime? Not so sure, but here we are going into the new rate cutting cycle. This is a very different reality from what we had heard of just a few months ago. Now this here is an opinion piece coming from Bill Dudley. And of course, if you don't know who he is, he's the former New York Fed president. The Fed might not cut rates more than once. That's what he's saying. And I wanted to talk about why he thinks that's the case. In the top paragraph, he's basically saying that what they are doing here is they are looking at the data and specifically the trade issues going on between the US and China. He thinks things are getting better. In the bottom, they were looking at inflation and he's saying that we actually see a slight tick up in these inflationary pressures in the other data surrounding that. So at this point, they'll probably cut once. They're going to see this data moving along and then they are not going to need to do so. But of course, that's what he says. Now, this information comes from a source that is very relevant in this particular case, but ultimately, we will only see this coming at that very moment, okay? So we don't know what's gonna happen before it does. Then we have Northman Trader, who I like to follow all the time, show you this before, and this really leads me into the next part of the video. Defined as intelligent investing, dollar cost average passively into index funds, tracking a shrinkable investable universe of stocks, not knowing what you actually own or exposed to, where everybody owns the same things, but nobody ever sells because the Fed will keep it all safe. He said it perfectly and this is basically summarizing my videos all into one Twitter statement. Now this looks very hurtful to a lot of people out there who are doing this exact strategy. Why? It's easy. It's easy to do this. Look, I'm just going to buy some S&P 500 ETF. I'll do so on a monthly basis. If it's higher, it's lower, it's okay. I'm just going to keep doing that and over time I'm going to make money, quote unquote make money. This is what most people are doing. That's totally fine. However, you run into a problem when every Everybody is rushing to the exits. That's what a lot of people do not understand. And this right here, right now, whatever, you know, 2020, 2021, 2025, whenever it comes, we are going to see something of a magnitude which we have never seen before. And ETFs will play a big role in that as well as, of course, computer algorithms, high frequency trading, and so on. Here you're looking at my favorite chart and that is the S&P 500 versus the global money supply and these are obviously linked together. They are conjoined at the hip. 
You will see this time and time again, right through 2018. We saw what happened with the central banks, what they were doing, the minor contraction, this very, very small contraction in their money supply globally started to create an actual downturn in the economy, in the markets. And that was a very big issue that they needed to reverse quickly. Now the ECB stopped printing money for about one month and they needed to set up a new policy again. They had brought interest rates down into the negative and this doesn't look like it's stopping anytime soon. Companies are ramping up share buybacks and they're increasingly using debt to do so. The two most important factors for why stocks have risen from 2009 up until the present has been stock buybacks and money printing. This has been the case and, and there is nobody with any sense, nobody with two cells in their brain will deny. It's just an absolute fact. You can look at the data, you can see it for yourself. When you have a trillion dollars worth of money, flowing into these particular stocks, a handful of stocks, you will see them rise to new valuations all the time. And you see that this is actually now a benefit. Before it was considered manipulation of the stock price. Now today, we see it as the best possible thing for stocks. And I do not agree. Sure, if you're holding the stock, it's fantastic. But what happens when there is a recession? They stop doing buybacks. Look at the previous time. So now your biggest support Support is no longer there. That is very troublesome. They're not going to do this if earnings start to get hit. They're not going to do so if there is a recession. But time and time again, people get themselves hooked on the drip. They need that drip, whether it's coming from the central banks, whether it's coming from the companies themselves. They simply want a way for this to rise artificially, if not naturally. Okay, if we're not going to get a strong economy, if we're not going to get strong markets, strong business activity, I want it to be artificial. I want to live in a virtual reality world where I can get what I need. And that's what people are facing today. They don't even know what hit them. I just want to mention something very quickly. A Fed rate cut will have zero impact on the housing market. Mortgage rates are already at three year lows. What we are proposing right now is that by reducing interest rates, that's going to fix the problems. Of course, that is not the case. When you look at what interest rates are doing right now, we're seeing them excessively low. 2.25 to 2.5 on the Fed funds rate. Mortgage rates, as they say here, are at three year lows. And still we are watching this vulnerable, highly vulnerable market that is being affected by all of these different problems that we see around the world, the Brexit issue that they bring up every day. We're looking at what's happening with China, with the US and China, the slowdown that is pervasive all around and why. We have interest rates super low. We've had all this accommodative policy from the central banks around the world. We have all of them making it as easy as possible to borrow money on every level. Look at China, the repo rate keeps going down over the past few years. There's a lot of data here that people are not aware of because why? Dollar cost average, the ETFs, and don't worry about anything else because everything's been doing fine so far. So why do I need to worry? Check this out here. Key global and US economic indicators are worse today than in September 2007, the last time the Fed cut rates for the first time after a long hike cycle. So this is basically comparing all of these different metrics, whether we're looking at different PMIs, and then you can go down the list and see them comparing if it was worse today or 2007. All of these cases, of course, are all worse. Now, what was interesting about 2007 was that I don't think the actual cycle was able to finish. This collapsed on its own because because of what was happening with the subprime rates, because of the loss of trust that was happening within the financial system, and we see the weakness that prevailed there. In 2000, 2001, we saw a different story because that was this extreme valuation for these corporations that didn't deserve it whatsoever, and we saw this come to an end. This hyper bubble that was formed, particularly with technology stocks, but of course, it made it out into many other things as well, and we saw these markets coming 
down, down, down. If you think about it, looking at the technology stocks throughout this period, they hit an extremely high number. Those that survived, if you look at the NASDAQ in general, I mean, come on, we're talking about 14 years to get back to where it was before. That is not a healthy sign, but this was something very different in these two cycles that I just wanted to note. If you look at the ISM manufacturing in the United States, or you look at the PMIs coming out of Europe and Asia and so on, all of these together look very dismal. You are seeing a very big problem today that were not even present in 2007, that many times were not present in the year 2000, 2001. And so we have an issue that is going on that will not be resolved by cutting rates, not by 25 basis points, not by 50 basis points, not even if they break it down to zero. You can't fix this problem with a central bank. Monetary policy is more constrained overseas than in the United States. You could see right here the central bank policy rates comparing the US, the Eurozone, and Japan. Very clear that we are down to nothing in these two areas, the Eurozone and Japan. Very different from the United States. The United States looks like the interest rates are very high. And if you compare them to the Eurozone or Japan, yes, they are much higher. But ultimately, we are at near record lows right now. Central bank balance sheets as a percentage of the GDP, Japan being this one country that has gone into astronomical territory to never come back from. Whereas you look at the United States, it looks healthier because they are actually deleveraging in this case here, but they're going to stop that very soon. And of course, they will keep this on their balance sheet and will probably print more money in the near future. Yes, you compare these two together and you could say, well, the United States seems to be a little bit more responsible, but of course, that's not the case because you see the sheer amount that they have been printing up over the years, it's not good. Plus, you look at their open market operations with the amount of money that they print in order to keep interest rates low. This is not a good thing. Here we can see the debt of these different countries. They're paying particular attention to China, saying China's debt buildup is massive on both a local and global scale. Credit to the private non-financial sector as a percentage of the GDP comparing 2008 for China to 2018. If you look at these different countries, you could see how much growth there has been in the debt between these different time frames. I just wanted to show you that. I think it's important to see it on a whole comparing the GDP numbers because when you see something as a number, it doesn't necessarily make any sense, but at least when we look at it as a percentage of, let's say the GDP, while that number is manipulated, if you keep it within that frame, it just gives you an idea of how far it has come. And this is not good because of course, all this debt is tied into derivatives and these different products that these financial institutions are ready to hit the trigger on and only time will tell what's gonna happen. Nobody really knows how bad it's gonna be, but I do believe that we are in for one hell of a ride. The ratio of industrial to precious metals is strongly correlated to and fallen in line with growth. Very interesting here. Never seen this one before, but you can see the manufacturing PMI as well as the GSCI industrial metals, precious metals ratio that tells us right here that it is not looking good. We see an actual contraction that will continue for the foreseeable future. If it's anything like the two previous times, both of these seem to be heading downward, okay? And that's not good because they think that we are heading upward from this point. They are making things seem like we are heading on to greener pastures and so on, but I'm not sure that's the case. Looking at the same information versus the 10-year yield, and of course, this shows us the same thing. So it's an interesting correlation that they've pulled up here. Very quickly, two more quality defensive factors driving the S&P higher, and the same factors are working in in fixed income markets. Take a look at this. You could see the comparison between the S&P 500 and the high yield over investment grade. When you see this, it shows you the real truth. And that is where the money is going today is a flight for safety. There is certain elements taking risk and that is the computer algorithms. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you see that individuals, the fund companies and so on, they are trying to actually take less risk at this point. 
Broader indices continue to underperform the S&P 500, a bad signal for growth reacceleration. This is just comparing the Russell 2000 over the S&P 500 and the Wilshire 5000 over the S&P 500. And you can see this has been trending down. I just wanted to show you that because a lot of people, they focus on the FANG stocks, they focus on the NASDAQ, they focus on the S&P 500. But what about in more broad terms? Why aren't you looking at these other markets that are very important to see to try and gauge what's happening in wide terms? Nobody wants to do that. All they want is their seven shares of Amazon. That's all for this video. If you found it informative, don't go anywhere. You got to hit that like button. Hit one button to support this channel. I do appreciate that very much. If you want the financial education you were not taught in school, these two books have everything you need from top to bottom, A to Z. All the details you need are in the link in the description. If you want the audiobook, that's available at themoneygps.com. If you want to know what's going on, you got to watch this video. I break it all down for you, so don't go anywhere. Click on it, and I will see you there.